So during our Zoom session for this um, lecture, we'll be looking at what has happened in evolution of life on land since the Paleozoic. But I want to finish this series of videos by looking at how vertebrates have moved onto land. Uh, so bear in mind, uh, as many of you will know, all land vertebrates are members of a clade, the tetrapods. And indeed, some aquatic animals are actually just tetrapods that return to the sea. I'm sure that won't come as a surprise to many of you. So, for example, think of the whales. But the original move of vertebrates onto land, the evolution of tetrapods from tetrapod-like fish, is one of the most studied topics in paleontology. So all I get to do really today is provide a relatively brief overview of this important event. So bear in mind that this is just that. So the first vertebrates on land evolved in the Devonian period between 385 and 375 million years ago. They evolved from lungfish, a group that is still around today. Some examples from lungfish from around this time are shown at the top here in this diagram that shows the silhouette, the outline and the skeleton of a series of iconic taxa that bridge the transition from living in the oceans to living on land for vertebrates. These two creatures here are examples of tetrapodomorph fish. For example, they share the skull shapes that we see in classic examples of early tetrapods, such as Ichthyostega and Acanthostega, which are shown on the second row here. In these early lungfish, I've already mentioned, the swim bladder had evolved to become a lung. But we see other changes in the evolution of this group beyond just the lungs. So, for example, um, the tetrapods ultimately evolve fully developed pectoral and pelvic girdles, kind of the ring of bones that you find um, at the front end and the back end of a fish or a tetrapod. So, pectoral girdles in most fishes is effectively, this, this structure is effectively part of the skull. You can see that quite clearly here in this creature. And every impact from, for example, walking on land would be transmitted right into the skull. So that's not ideal. And this, over the course of early tetrapod evolution, became entirely separated from the skull and enlarged. Also, early tetrapods had between six and eight digits on each foot or hand, on each limb end. And there, then what we see as the group evolves is a reduction in digits through time. Um, so there are ongoing studies in the biomechanics of the evol biomechanics of the evolution, the biomechanics of locomotion within the early tetrapods. Um, and this uh, paper that I've put here from 2012 is a fantastic example of how we can use biomechanical um, advances to understand uh, exactly how some of these early tetrapods may have been moving. But these studies suggest that um, certainly the early tetrapods were largely still aquatic animals, but one which could perhaps flop around on land on occasion. So, for example, we know that Ichthyostega, um, which is panel uh, D here, was probably better at terrestrial locomotion than Acanthostega, which is panel C here and it was much more robust. So we, we can kind of start to unravel some of the transition, some of the changes that happen in this transition. So as a result of that work, we can say that limb evolution occurred first in the water towards supporting organisms on, um, on land, and then continued to evolve when these organisms move onto land. I've highlighted a number of other specializations within this group towards life on land in video number two, so I'm not going to go into that any further here. I'm sorry to say though, that there are actually some gaps in our fossil record here as well. So vital early transitions in tetrapod evolution are actually poorly um, documented due to a thing that we call in the world of the tetrapods, Roma's gap. There's actually a bigger gap than this in the world of um, arthropods. So these, um, this lack of fossils between, in the case of the arthropods, 380 and 340 million years ago of organisms on land has long been the matter of the debate. Uh, of debate. And what caused it remains uh, relatively, um, well, we're relatively uncertain as to the cause. In part, we can say it's because of a low number of terrestrial rocks. So we're not getting many fossils of life on land during this important time period. 
and it may be that there were elements of the geochemistry of this time period that did not lend themselves towards fossilizing these organisms. But there are also recent suggestions, and I've put a number of, um, of references on this slide that may be of interest if you're interested about this kind of particular time period, that suggest that this may actually reflect, at least in the vertebrates, a real genuine lack of diversity. So we do know that in this time period, as we're going into the Carboniferous period, um, there was a extinction in the late Devonian period. Uh, and that led to an evolutionary bottleneck. And there may, as a result, have been low diversity within this time period. We also know that this is correlated with a period of unusually low atmospheric oxygen concentration. This has been independently determined from um, geochemistry of rocks formed during this period. And so that will also be impacting on the life that was around at the time. So bear in mind, that we have this period between 385 and 375 million years ago where we get these kind of really exciting glimpses at tetrapods evolving and then there's a bit of a gap although it must be said that in recent years um, work such as that documented in this 2012 paper here have actually been helping us fill some of that gap so it's an exciting time i think to work in the tetrapod uh, um, kind of fish to tetrapod transition so the end of Roma's gap actually brings us firmly to within the Carboniferous period. So let's have a quick look at the Carboniferous. Um, if you remember, um, we talked about this very briefly in our paleoecology lecture, how in the Carboniferous we saw um, coal swamps. I think it was our paleoecology lecture. Definitely we've mentioned the coal swamps at one point during this, um, this series of lectures. Uh, and either way, we know that there was this wide spanning tropical region that, like today's rainforests, exhibited a warm and humid environment, perfect growing conditions for a diverse array of plant groups. And the, the, those forests were filled by a, a cool variety of different organisms. And indeed, we actually have widespread preservation of life on land at this time period in the late Carboniferous, um, which is shown on the map on the left hand side here, thanks to all of these plants forming coal. So you can see um, coal deposits marked in black on the left hand side here. So if you recall between the Carboniferous and the Permian, we had increasing aridification, which you can see in the disappearance of all of this coal and the appearance of all of these evaporites. But all of that coal fueled the um, Industrial Revolution and associated with that coal, we actually have a wide range of different fossils of life on land. So these fossils tell us that by the Carboniferous, these extensive coal swamps were present and they comprised seedless plants, such as ferns and club mosses, and also gymnosperms. These are plants with true seeds, which ultimately are an innovation that allowed them to diversify on land. So examples of the diverse plant life that's reconstructed so beautifully in this image on the slide here that I sadly wasn't able to actually find a source from. Um, the, so examples of these included early tree-like relatives of the extant club mosses, which form the main body of these lowland swampy areas. These are plants that grew in, in to heights in excess of 50 meters. They were giants of the forest, and they generally comprised a single trunk, which was supported by shallow roots, and that trunk bore leaves and reproductive organs. Uh, a really good, uh, famous example of this is a fossil called leopard, the Lepidodendron. There were also early relatives of the horsetails around at this time and a wide variety of ferns. Indeed, ferns were a common sight in the coal forests and exhibited a variety of morphologies from small plants, such as those we are f familiar with today, through to larger tree-like forms. So those are the, the plants that make up these um, forests that are the source of much of our coal um, in North America and Europe. So moving on to the vertebrates that were around at this time living in these Carboniferous coal forests. Well, these were probably predators consuming freshwater fish or terrestrial arthropods. And we can so also say that in vertebrates, we think that a restricting factor until the Carboniferous period was reproduction. Eggs had to be laid in water and probably fertilization um, relied on, on things being moist as well. Um, but we think that several pivotal phases in tetrapod evolution that helped overcome those limitations may have occurred in these Carboniferous coal forests. So the split between the true amphibians, 
This is the, a group called the Lysamphibia, that's frogs, Sicilians, and salamanders, and a group called the Amniotes, that's mammals and sauropsids, the sauropsids being uh, reptiles and birds, may have occurred in the late Devonian. So this big split in the vertebrate tree of life between amphibians and everything else may have been late Devonian, but it's hard to pin that down exactly once more, thanks to Roma's gap here in this period. And so we first pick up that split, we think, in the Carboniferous coal forests. So I've introduced you to the, the idea that there are these two um, different um, tetrapod groups, the um, amphibians and essentially everything else. Those, that's the lysamphibia and the amniotes. Um, so a really question is where we start seeing the split in these Carboniferous coal forests. Well, I can tell you that the relationships of the early tetrapods and what came from them is a matter of very active debate and research. And I don't think it's going too far to say quite a lot of arguments as well. Currently, uh, my feeling is that the more widely held hypothesis is that the amphibians lie close in their origins to a group called the Temnospondyls. These are creatures defined by a broad skull with a rounded front margin and an open palate that's at least half as wide as the skull. So that's one of our groupings of creatures in these early coal forests. Some examples are shown on the left of this image here. By contrast, I think the origins of the amniotes may lie closer to a group called the Lepospondyls. Those are shown in the middle here. This is quite a diverse group, but they're, they're generally smaller than the Temnospondyls. Um, uh, with, and you can see, in fact, just from this image, that there are quite a wide range of different forms. The first true amniotes, members of that group that includes the mammals and the reptiles, um, are actually, um, have actually been found, I should say, sorry, in the Carboniferous coal forests. So there are some fossils which are reptile-like in form, um, and they're, they're all small to medium-sized insect eaters. Indeed, it was during the Permian period after this time that there was an explosion in amniote diversity. But nevertheless, the origins of this important, or both these important groups, the amphibians and the amniotes, lie in these Carboniferous coal forests. So what were the arthropods doing at this time? I'm sure you're all asking, because why would you not? Well, there was some cool stuff going on. There was lots of oxygen in the atmosphere for a variety of reasons. If you want to know why, please ask me and I can explain in the Zoom session. Um, and indeed, this has driven, we think, some um, gigantification in some arthropod groups. So this example on the top here is a thing called Arthropleura. This is a relative of the millipedes that grew up to about three meters in length. There were insects that were relatives of the uh, dragonflies and the damselflies that grew potentially up to 70 centimeters to a meter in terms of their wingspan. Um, and so what we're looking at is a picture where we've actually got all of our major arthropod groups on land by this point. So you can see that we've got myriapods, millipedes and centipedes in their kin. There were arachnids around. This is another example of that group I called the, uh, the trignotarbids. These were predators in this ecosystem. And other arachnids such as this cool whip, scorp whip scorpion. No, that's a whip spider. This cool whip spider here. And on the right hand side, you can see that there were a wide range of insects around and indeed, by this point, the insects had taken to the sky. So we know that not only had by this point insects taken to the sky, but essentially many of the major splits in the tree of life of the winged insects had occurred. We've talked in our Zoom sessions um, at more length than I intended to, I must admit, because of the uh, papers that have just been released on wing origin theories and how we don't know what the precursor was. But um, we do know that this must have happened at some point before the Carboniferous period. And sadly, we know that that isn't well sampled by the fossil record. Essentially, we have no insect fossils um, that are definitively winged insects until 315 million years ago, at which point suddenly we see many of the major orders, the major groups of insects appear very suddenly in the fossil record. And all of that brings us to the end of this particular video and it also brings us to the end of the last video of the course evolution and paleobiology um, so thank you very much for sticking with it to the end i've really appreciated um, your engagement with this course as it's gone along 
I realize we faced quite a lot of challenges this year with the way we've had to deliver this course and your engagement with this process, your uh, turning up to Zoom, um, uh, talking about the uh, topics we've asked you to talk about and asking lots of interesting questions has really, really helped make this a far more rewarding experience. So thank you very much um, for making it this far. So in our Zoom session associated with, with this course, as well as providing you with some overviews or, or some insights into the exam um, and examining process this year, which I think are quite important, we'll be talking about events that have happened in the evolution of terrestrial life since um, the Carboniferous period. So just some major events that we may want to consider. So please do come along um, uh, for our final Zoom session. When you've finished that Zoom session, you may well want to come back to this website and scroll just down a little bit um, to the bonus material because we're very lucky at the University of Manchester that we have actually one of the world experts on the evolution of bipedalism in apes working at the university. This is Dr. Marta Pina Miguel, who has very kindly recorded a special video just for the uh, finale for this course to provide an insight into how bipedalism, so walking on two legs, has evolved in the ancestors of humans that I hope you all find really interesting and rewarding. I think it's fantastic. So please, when we're done with Zoom, do check out that video. Thank you again for um, making it this far, and I look forward to seeing you in Zoom in a few days' time. Bye.